Hello everyone, my name is Evan Neon, and I'm reporting on Esteban Iso, or Esteban the Moor. Uh, I didn't know a lot about Esteban before I started studying for this project, uh, but I'm glad I have, and I hope that you enjoy the history I was able to dig up. Um, Esteban is most well known as the first black person ever mentioned by name in American history. Um, as you see here, he has many goes by many different names and each comes from a story in his um, time spent exploring America and he's also accredited with uh, discovering New Mexico and Arizona being the first person to ever step foot there um, besides the Native Americans. Uh, it's important to start where it all began which for Esteban was in Ezemor, Morocco um, in 1486, its inhabitants um, began paying tribute to the King of Portugal, uh, who is John II, the first picture you see there. Um, after John II passed, Manuel uh, I, um, the second picture here, confirmed a treaty between the Moroccans and the Portuguese Empire. Um, in 1497, and it said that each town was to be was to pay 10,000 surveys uh, every year to the king. By uh, 1513, Azamor's governor Moulay Zayam refused to pay the tribute and mustered a pretty substantial uh, army that was well equipped. Um, it's not surprising during this time that a West African governor was able to rally such a well-equipped and powerful army uh, since this was the beginning of the transatlantic slave trade and uh, many times conquered African tribes were able to be sold pretty easily for guns and matters of warfare. Esteban was enslaved by the Portuguese and was eventually sold in 1520, seven years after the uprising, to a Spaniard named Don Andreas Dortanes. Um, the he, Dortanes was a uh, Spanish noble born to a small family. Uh, they were wealthy, but they were not extremely wealthy, and he looked to the New World as a way of finding his path or his new wealth. Um, it was these aspirations that led him to join Panafilo de Narvez, we will see pictured there in the top right corner. Um, Narvez's interesting side story was actually sent over um, to the um, disciplined Cortez, um, whose atrocities had made their way back to the Spanish king. Um, by the time Narvez made it there, Cortez actually knew he was coming, um, captured his fleet, and imprisoned him for four years after taking out his right eye. Um, after the king learned this, um, he ordered Cortez to let Narvez go and um, appointed him governor of Florida. Um, after Narvez actually saw the wealth that uh, Cortez had accumulated in Mexico by conquering the native tribes, uh, he wanted his piece of the action as well. So. Um, being governor and um, hoping for the same outcome, he petitioned for the uh, Emperor of Spain, uh, Charles V, to commission a special voyage um, into the New World and North America. And so it was. Uh, Charles V uh, commissioned uh, Narvez's fleet in 1527 to explore the New World um, with it. He allowed for 600 soldiers, colonizers, and sailors, two dozen of their wives, and five monks to accompany the exploration. As one of the ship's captain, uh, Alvar Nunez Cabeza de Vaca, who I'll be speaking much of during the presentation, um, was head treasurer and a special counsel to the emperor um, appointed as one of the ship's captains. Um, 
The other ships were to be led by Castillo, um, another by Dortanes and Esteban, and the last by Narvez. Um, as you see here, this is a statue of Cabeza. Um, he will be one of the principal sources that I use through, um, throughout this journey. Um, as he was the treasurer, no doubt, he saw the importance of writing things down, and he kept a brief diary throughout the um, entire journey, of which he spoke most um, of the Indians and their culture, um, but he did not leave out the importance of Esteban throughout the trip, um, and that's where I found most of my research. Um, you see next to him a statue that is actually a copy of the uh, original text, uh, Relicion, um, that today there are only three surviving of. Um, one is in the British Library, one is in the John Brown Library, and one is in the New York Public Library. Um, unfortunately, when they were first translated from um, Spanish to English, a lot of the original maps were to, um, destroyed. Um, but I do have a few reconstructed maps later on in the presentation so you can see the voyage. Nevertheless, on June 17, 1527, Narvez expedition left Spain on their way to Hispanola, um, the small island next to Cuba, and Santo Domingo uh, was their port of destination. They reached there um, late August, early September, uh, 1527 still. Um, decided to make it to Cuba um, in, by November. Um, they hungered down around Trinidad for the winter. Um, left Trinidad uh, at 1528, um, early February. Uh, it was at this time where the troubles of the exploration began. Um, over 140 men had already, um, due to maybe the harshness of the winter or possibility of setting out on their own in the New World, had already deserted the party. And uh, still, Esteban stayed loyal uh, to his master, Dortanes, and um, in the expedition. Um, it was around. 1528 in mid-March when the expedition um, left Havana, um, Cuba, and sailed north in, hope, try, in hopes for trying to reach the Gulf region and start their exploration. Um, after a bad hurricane um, that downed two more ships um, and men, the remaining party made it to the Bay of Cross. Uh, which is present-day Tampa Bay, Florida, um, where Cabeza writes that it is the most beautiful port he's ever seen, and uh, they proceed to dock there. <coughs> Initial contact with the Indians proved well. Um, the exploration was docked at the bay and um, met up with some of the local inhabitants that traded for food and um, actually ended up trading Narvez, um, a bell-like object that Cabeza notes um, was made of gold. Um, as I said before, this was Narvez's uh, main goal was to find the new treasures of the world and so his interest was immediately sparked um, after demanding that the local Indians um, give them the remaining treasure, they uh, directed him towards the Appalachian Indians, saying that they had uh, much more to be had there. Um, and Narvez um, took the Indians captive, used them as guides, and directed them to uh, take him to the Appalachian tribes. Uh, upon arriving at the villages, um, the party found no gold uh, and poorly built adobe houses. Um, the Appalachian did have food, however, which uh, helped, and a total of 40 horses were traded um, for food and supplies. Uh, 
the Appalachie directed the party to head back to the coastal region of the Ayuit tribes um, and saying that they would have the treasure that they were seeking. Uh, Narvez was starting to notice that his men were both tired and hungry um, and decided this to be the best course of action to head back to the coast. Um, in their travels back south, the uh, Jabez writes of the Indians that uh, attacked them along the way, um, killing them, killing over 40 men. Um, and by the time they reached the uh, village of the Ayoit, the entire village had been burned and everyone uh, was gone. Uh, pretty disheartened by this point. The party made it to the coastal lines, um, was too tired to make it back to their ships, and by uh, August 5th, Narvez of 1528, um, demanded that the party make uh, makeshift barges. Um, still having their horses, a few alive, um, they used them as a food source. Um, killing one every three days to feed the shipbuilders and the people to, that were traveling inland toward the Ayuit abandoned village um, that were collecting supplies. Um, Cabeza notes in his, um, in his logs that this task seemed to be impossible, um, as you see his quote here. Uh, he noted that they did not know how to build ships, uh, nor were there any tools uh, that they were accustomed to. Um, that what they ended up using was pitch pine for um, resin, um, parts of a palmento tree as their caulk, um, the horse tails and manes from the slaughtered horses were used as ropes, and um, they were able to fashion together 35 foot barges, um, five of them, um, while sitting there stranded on the coastline. On September 22nd, 1528, the ships were built and they set off eating the last of the horses. Um, it was here that Cabeza notes a um, fault he had with Narvez, saying that he split the expedition up with the remaining um, able bodies to travel by land and the sick and few uh, bodies it took to man the barges to come aboard as they would follow parallel on the coastline until they reached the next harbor. Um, it's important to notice these facts uh, because you see the status of Esteban slowly rising throughout um, the expedition. Um, at first he was the lonely slave of Thortanes. Um, at this point he had been the head translator for their contact with the Indians. He also was able to um, help fashion the ships and ended up being named guide uh, from this point on as their westward travels continued. Um, he actually manned and captained one ship um, along with Dortains and um, Narvez was on the other. Uh, Castillo finished with the third as two of the ships were immediately taken down by the harsh waves on the coastal line. Um, Narvez's disastrous leadership uh, actually led the party along the coastline um, through many hurricanes, um, one of which wiped out Narvez's ship as he turned around and said that everyone was for themselves um, and he relinquished his leadership. Uh, the only ships remaining then was Dortanes and Estebans um, and the other containing Cabez and Castillo. Um, the parties met on after being whisked away by yet another storm um, 
to the far side, west side of the Gulf, uh, to the island of misfortune named by Cabez. Um, it's present day in Galveston, Texas, or off the Galveston Island there. Um, and they landed on November 6th of 1528. Uh, as you can imagine, this is in the middle of winter. Um, the winds had blown all of the ships apart and um, actually sank Cabezas into the water before they landed, leaving everyone wet. Um, it was trying to survive through this winter that the party was whittled from 80 down to 15. Um, and actually, some of their sickness was um, spread throughout the neighboring Indian tribes. If it wasn't for Estevan and his translation skills, uh, perhaps this is where the story would end. But in fact, um, after the Indians accused the Spaniards of bringing the sickness uh, and sorcery upon them, they demanded that they were to cure their, their sick uh, in the local tribes. Esteban, being a quick thinker, um, remembered some incantations he had learned from previous tribes, um, and both him, Dortanes, and uh, Cabez all um, went to the sick, uh, began chanting while the two Spaniards uh, made the symbol of a cross and began singing the Ave Maria over and over again um, until um, surprisingly, I guess this works. Um, the Indians revere the Esteban um, and the remaining um, healers as medicine men and um, spread this tale throughout the coastal region. Uh, this allowed them to uh, leave the captivity of those uh, tribes. Um, Cabeza actually was so sick that he remained as the, um, the 13 remaining travelers, um, one being Esteban, um, traveled further west. As you can see in the map here of their travels, um, they actually made it over towards the northern rim of, New Me of Mexico, um, hoping to find the consulate uh, to Spain. Um, that they know had previously been set up by other conquistadors. Um, Cabezo notes that he stayed with these Indians for over a year, and um, he relates himself as being a slave and uh, begins reflecting on how slavery um, is so immoral now that he has been a part of it. Um, you can see his change um, by how he refers to Esteban from then out. Uh, he no longer refers to him as El Negro or the Black, he refers to him as Estoniso, um, giving him an official title and name. Um, as Esteban continued to lead the party, um, they were unable to find the consulate and actually uh, was stopped by the Yugays tribe and taken because of um, how malnourished and sick they had to have been by this point. Uh, they stayed with the tribe. Uh, Cabez walked um, for nearly six years, he uh, estimates, uh, bartering from tribe to tribe along the coast, uh, trying to find his uh, once 600 strong party that was now whittled down um, to near nothing. They finally meet up um, at the Uge's village uh, where Esteban, Castillo, Dortanes, um, and one other man had survived. Um, Cabez asked why they had not carried on or tried to escape, and it was because Castillo and Esteban were both too afraid to swim across the water since they did not know how to swim. Uh, they were, uh, Cabez ends up being um, captured by the Indians and stayed there for eight months um, devising a plan to finally leave. Um, they were able to escape during one of the rituals of the, the area that the uh, men were to go out and pick the prickly pear um, 
a local fruit of the area so they could harvest up for winter. Um, they were uh, able to sneak away and continue their exploration, as you can see by this map, uh, more towards um, Mexico and into the Arizona and New Mexican re regions. Here they came across um, many different tribes and um, in fact um, Esteban was honored with many different gifts as he went in and healed the sick with his newfound uh, physician calling. Um, the uh, As it was the practice for the native Indians, the healer would receive uh, many gifts uh, as praise for his good deeds. Uh, and as you see here, the picture depicting uh, Esteban um, it's labeled as the African warrior, uh, but you can see his large headdress there and his um, spear or rattler next to him is uh, some of the different gifts that are honored that will actually lead to his demise later on. If it were not for Esteban's translation skills and um, his ability to be seen as a medicine man among the local tribes. Um, there is no way that this story may have ever been told. Uh, they actually garnered a following of many different Indians who called them the children of the sun for their ability to heal and both kill. Um, at this point there were only four left in the party um, and they continued on traveling until they were reunited uh, with Spaniards. Uh, they had actually come across a village that had been burned and a few of the stragglers had said that local Spaniards had come through and conquered them. They tracked them down um, and on the early part of January 1536 uh, Esteban actually was able to meet up with the Spanish soldiers um, of what is now state of Sinola in northwest Mexico. Uh, they were then taken back to Culiacan, a uh, frontier outpost of New Spain, um, there in Mexico. Um, by July 1536, after the harsh winter had passed, they were taken to uh, Cortez and Mendoza uh, in Mexico City. It is debated here that Esteban um, was freed um, after he told of the different stories that he had heard along the way, one of being the seven cities of Chibola uh, in the western part of New Mexico where he had traveled. Um, the seven cities was the fabled uh, cities made of gold and they had uh, much riches. Uh, this of course intrigued Cortez um, and Antonio de, Mo de, de Mendoza. Um, some say that he again was freed, others say that uh, and, uh, Mendoza actually purchased Esteban Niso from Dorotanes and started planning the expedition for the City of Gold. Um, three years later, Friar Marcos de Nazia was appointed the expedition leader and um, actually Cortez required the Mexican Indians um, that he had gained as captives to haul goods that could be traded for the jewels and gold once they arrived at the city. Uh, Esteban Niso was ordered to guide the party and took off on March 7th, 1539. Um, they made camp uh, around Easter in the town of Vapaca, um, just, um, just so Esteban Niso could actually head out with some of the fellow Indians and um, hopefully send word back that he had found the cities. Uh, it was only four days until Esteban sent back word. Uh, the friar had devised a plan that if he were to find um, a clue or a, a city to send back a cross and depending on the importance how big the cross would be um, would describe the message. Uh, it's rumored that the first cross that came um, was as big as a man and um, um, 
actually was the finding of Estoniso of one of the um, beginning towns of the seven cities of Chibola. Uh, this town would be um, inhabited by the, a Zuni tribe of the Apata Indians. Um, they As Estemaniso would many times um, send his feather um, head dressing and um, rattles that he had gained along the way as a medicine man, he would send them into the town um, to show a sign of his prestige and they always welcomed him in after this. Um, he would speak of where they were trying to find and be directed on his way. Um, this town that he had found uh, by the Zuni, though, um, add to the misfortune of Esteban's exploration. Um, they, the, one of the shaking devices that Esteban had sent in was actually made by one of the sworn enemies of the Zuni tribe, which they immediately recognized. And the tribe chieftain sent back saying, please do not enter um, or your lives will be taken. Uh, Esteban, having been backed by a small party, um, deterred the message and decided to enter the uh, camp. Um, the rest of the story ends with Friar Marco saying um, a messenger ran back who had actually escaped the captivity of the Zunis um, saying that Esteban had tried to also escape and was killed in doing so. Um, the he did say that there was small wealth found in the city where the friar rode up to uh, just so he could see, but in his documentation says that if he were to try to conquer the land, um, no one may know of the Seven Cities tale, so he actually turned back and went back to Mexico to report. Um, there is the end of Esteban's story, as the significance of Esteban uh, as I said before, he's the first black person ever to be named in history, by, uh, ever to be named in American history, rather. Um, he did find New Mexico and Arizona in his travels and was able to actually map some of the land, um, and that's how Cabeza actually was able to send back to Spain of their... And so ends the tale of Estevaniso uh, in 1539 with his death. I uh, hope everyone has enjoyed the story as much as I did researching it, um, but I am supposed to ask one question, um, and here it is, it is as follows. If Esteban the Moor, who was a Muslim from West Africa, uh, had so many chances uh, to escape, desert, or possibly even um, kill his master. Why do you think that he stuck around and was uh, such an influential part of the exploration into the Gulf region, Arizona, New Mexico area? Um, and second, do you think that his upbringing in West Africa, um, being tribal and possibly nomadic, uh, might have played a role in his ability to assimilate or uh, speak and translate with the Native American population. Uh, those are my questions. I hope everyone has a great week and thanks again.